want to start this morning with a, a little story about my beautiful wife, Laura. Um, so after VBS just the other day, she decided to take the two children that she's nannies into the car wash. Well, not them into the car wash, but to drive through the car wash, just to clarify. And as she's going, uh, the kids wanted to listen to this book on, on, uh, you know, on the radio and uh, that they've been playing. And so they want to listen to it while they're in the car wash. And so she, she get, pulls up the car wash. And you know, if you've been to the one where the guy guides you and he says, hey, put it in, uh, you know, uh, put it in neutral, take your foot off the brake, right? And just get ready. It's going to roll through. So he's pointing to the giant signs. Take your foot off the brake, put it in neutral. Let's get ready for the ride of your life. And she does that and she, she shifts the car and she looks down and she's getting ready to play the book because the kids are like, play the book, play the book, play the book. And then she hears this bang not realizing she had to put the car in reverse and um, messed up the whole car wash. The guy has to come out with a crowbar and a drill. She has some of it on video and a drill. And she's telling me this and I'm like, did you drive off really fast so they didn't like charge you anything? I'm like, did you like get out of there? And she's like stuck. She's got the car wash in front of her. She's got people behind her. You know, the guy had honked on her on this horn and then it took him a while. And then finally they get it fixed. And the guy walks over to the light and he's like, neutral, put it in neutral. Thankfully, she got out of there before any charges came toward her. How many have ever just really messed something up? Okay, you just really have messed something up. Up. And let's be a little more specific this morning. How many of you have ever just really messed up a relationship? Raise your hand. You just really messed it up. Some of you are, are dealing with messed up relationships right now. Maybe it's a friendship. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's a relationship with an ex and you've got you know, joint custody of kids and you're just like, you don't know how to deal with it. Uh, maybe for you it's with your parents uh, or a sibling we deal with relationships our entire life. How many know that's true? And so we have this, this great responsibility to have good relationships. And as, as we think about that this morning, we're going to continue with our series. In fact, this is the final message in this series on Genesis. This is actually part 25. Can you believe that? We've been talking about the book of Genesis for so long. And if you've missed any of this series, you can go back and you can listen to it. And we've done our best to pull out some things God wants to teach us. And by the way, on August 7th, just in a couple weeks, I'm starting a new series called Church of the Movies. You do not want to miss it. It's going to be very evangelistic in nature. Bring a friend who doesn't know Jesus. Come and have a good time. There will be popcorn. Just letting you know. Today we're going to continue with our series in Genesis, and we're going to look at the life of Joseph and kind of finish up with who he is. And uh, we're going to learn this principle on how to restore relationships. Everybody say restore relationships. How many of you know that's important? We all know that's important. Now let's remind ourselves where Joseph is at at this point in the story because we're going to pick up at the very end. His brothers hated him. In fact, they plotted to murder him. And instead of murdering him, they sold him into slavery. In the process of being sold into slavery, he gets sold to this guy named Potiphar, who's captain of the guard, probably the chief ex executioner of Egypt. And uh, he gets there and he, God raises him up and begins to use him in a mighty way. And then he gets wrongfully accused of sexual misconduct and he's thrown into prison. In prison, he's forgotten about. He's left there and all this thing. And he's, he's kind of reeling from this whole aspect that his brothers abandoned him. His brothers hated him. His brothers sold him into slavery. He's, you know, abandoned by his family. And until one day, you know, Pharaoh has a dream and Joseph comes in and interprets the dream through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Pharaoh makes him second in command of all of Egypt. And then, because there's a great famine in the land, Jacob sends all of Joseph's brothers over to actually meet with this second in command that they don't, didn't know was their brother that they sold into slavery. And then they realize it's him, and then they have a little bit of restoration of relationship, and then they move to the land of Goshen, and then they're kind of one big happy family, or so it would seem. But then comes the day where Jacob, the father of them all, dies. And that today is where we pick up our story and how we're going to learn how to restore relationship. Because here's the thing you need to know. Life is short, therefore make your relationships great. Everybody say that's true. You have a short amount of time in this world, so you might as well make your relationships the best that they could ever be. I actually believe that's what God wants for your life. 
I actually believe that he wants you to make your relationships great. Every relationship in your life should be saturated with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to learn how to do that today. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 50. You can look up here on the notes or look on the Bible app, and we're going to pick up the story. Jacob dies, and watch what happens. Starting in verse 15, it says this, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs that we did to him? How many of you have ever thought, well, man, what if they're going to pay me back? What if some way they're going to retaliate because I acted this way or I did that or I said this or, you know, something in my past? And you just feel like, man, I'm going to, what if they retaliate? That's, that's the brothers. Now they know that the dad is, the dad's passed away and now they're dealing with their brother who's ruler basically of all of Egypt, has the power to do with them whatever he wants without recourse. And they're like, man, what if now, now the dad's dead, what if he decides to take his grudge out on us? Here's where we learn the very first principle, I believe, this morning on how we can restore relationships, and that's this. Write this down. Leave your grudges behind. Leave your grudges behind. Some of you, let's just be honest, you are really good at holding grudges. In fact, some of you falsely believe that's your spiritual gift. What's your spiritual gift from the Lord? Man, I hang on to things for years. That's what I do. Some of you are just like, that's a skill that you've developed all of your life. But here's what you need to know about grudges, and I hope you pay attention to this. Grudges only hurt you. It doesn't affect the other person the way you think it does. It only hurts you because it festers within you. It becomes this wound that never heals. It becomes infected in your spirit and you begin to think of things that you can do to the other person and you replay the scenario. Come on, you replay the scenario over and over and over and over and you think of all the ways you should have responded and all the things you should have said just to get at them and you hold that grudge and then you begin to think of things of malice and ways to return the favor, you know, and, and a tit for tat and all these things and you get to this point in your life where you're just like, oh, that's all you can meditate on. Maybe that's you this morning. You've been holding on to that grudge for far too long. It's only hurting you. And you might want to know this, that a grudge goes against God's Word. Did you know that? Look at Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. It says this, Don't seek revenge or bear a grudge. Everybody say don't. Just, that's the key word there. Don't. Don't seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. But, here's the opposite, but... Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You know why he says that at the end? Because he's the one who can tell us what to do. Right? Uh, <clears throat> remember, I'm, tell I'm the Lord. I'm telling you this. Don't seek revenge. Don't hold a grudge. But instead, love your neighbor as yourself. See, that's the opposite. The world has us go one way. We're like, man, oh man, I would never be friends with them again. Jokingly, I told my friend the other day, he said something sarcastic, and I just said, you know what I did? I signed up for Facebook just so I could unfriend you. <laughs> That's how you get back at people. Unfriended, deal with that hurt the rest of your life. Unfortunately, in our society, some of you, that's how you gauge your friendships by social media. That is not true friendship. Nor should you be dealing with serious friend and relationship issues on social media. Maybe I should do a series on that. I'm the Lord. See, grudges lead to vengeance and leads to retaliation and leads to all the things that God doesn't want you to do in your life. You know what it really leads to? A bad spirit. Leave your grudges behind. If anybody had it right to hold a grudge, it was Joseph. Look what Romans 12 says about it. it says, never pay back. Everybody say never. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do you know how everyone can see you're a person who holds a grudge? By the look on your face. It's called the grumpy dumps. It's called the angry look. It's called the resting grudge face. Some of you know what I'm talking about. 
My mind goes to holy things. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you're honorable. Do all that you can. Everybody say all. Okay, watch it. All that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the Scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. You know who's really good at paying people back? God is. You know who's really good at forgiving people? God is. God is way better at forgiving people than you are. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. He goes on and says, Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Some of you need to read that passage again this week. I'm really believing that for some of you, the walls of that hurt relationship, of that attitude you've been having, of that thing you've been festering in your life are going to be broken today through the power of God. You go to that person you've been so mean to for so long, and they say, why are you being so nice to me? Well, because Romans 12 says, when I am, I'm heaping burning coals on your head. <laughs> no. See, there can't be any malice. There can't be, why am I being nice to you? So that God would pay you back. We have to leave our grudges behind. Some of you, all jokes aside, boy, you need this. You're watching at home right now. You need this. You've been hanging on to that thing for far too long. You need to hold those thoughts captive and you need to make them obedient to Christ. You leave grudges behind. Joseph had to leave grudges behind. His brother's worried, man, he's going to hold this grudge. Watch what happens next. Verse 16, so they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of your servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. How do you restore relationships? Here it is. Be quick. To forgive. Be quick to forgive. Everybody say forgive. I hope you write that down somewhere because sometimes we take a little too long to forgive, don't we? We take a little bit too much time to forgive. And it becomes a problem in our life. His brothers came before him years after the mistreatment and they didn't repent outright, but they used the love Joseph had for his father as a tool to hopefully get in his good graces. Hey, your father wants you to forgive us of the wrongs and the sins. It was kind of their way of repenting, but not necessarily really repenting, but they wanted Joseph's forgiveness anyways. You and I have to have this attitude where we are people who are quick to forgive. I have a theory of why Joseph uh, burst out into tears in this, in this instance. And I think because it was all of a sudden this release for him of forgiveness. I think he didn't know how to deal with his brothers to the extent that he was so hurt by what they did. He was so scarred and, and crushed by what they did and years and years had passed. And then this came and his, they got this note from supposedly dad that says, hey, please forgive him. I think it was a moment where God dealt with his life and he just said, I just, I'm just I got to let it go. That's what forgiveness does for us. It's a release for us. We let it go. Unforgiveness hurts no one but you. It's, it's, it's something that you carry. It's like a weight on you. And it can destroy your life. And that's what God wants you to do. See, just as Joseph's brothers said, hey, your father wants you to forgive us, did you know that your heavenly father wants you to forgive other people? Look what it says in Matthew chapter 6. It says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. Really pay attention to this verse. 
Let's start at the beginning again. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, everybody say against me, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's a pretty heavy verse, isn't it? That's pretty serious when it deals with unforgiveness in our heart. You know what it means? It means that you cannot walk in the forgiveness of God and hold unforgiveness in the other hand at the same time. You can't say, God, I I accept your free gift of grace and forgiveness in my life, but I refuse to give it to other people. Isn't that amazing? You can't say, God, I'm so glad you forgive me every time I do wrong, which is a lot, uh, but man, I hate that person. That's not how it works in God's kingdom. As we have received from the Lord as God's people, we should be freely giving from the Lord as God's people. As God forgave me, I forgive you. And guess what? I didn't deserve for God to forgive me. That person you might have a hard time forgiving might not deserve it, but neither did you. And so I give my forgiveness to them as the Lord gives it to me. It's a free gift of grace. Some of you, that should blow your mind right now. Because we get so wrapped up in the emotional aspects of unforgiveness, like, man, I deserve, I deserve to carry this around. And it's almost like a badge of honor for some people. Man, you, you will not believe. And you're still talking about it years later. You will not believe what they did to me. We've all got those stories, don't we? We pretend we're, like we're the only ones. But we've all got those stories. Somehow, somewhere, somebody cut you deep, somebody hurt you, somebody did you wrong. And we feel like, man, I gotta, not only do I have to hold on to unforgiveness, but i got to tell everybody how bad it hurt. How about just forgive? Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't act like us when, when He says, uh, yeah, I forgive you, but not, let me go tell Bob what you did first. Hey, Bob, I forgive them, but let me tell you what they did, and it was really painful. Aren't you glad Jesus doesn't act like that? Anyone? Yeah, me too. We have to be quick to forgive, and we have to get rid of unforgiveness in our life. Ephesians 4 says this about it. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just, here it is again, just as in Christ, God forgave you. You see a pattern here in the Scriptures? Just as I've received the forgiveness from God, I give it out to other people. So I get rid of unforgiveness in my life. So Joseph has to deal with this. He has to cross this road just like you and I. He has to deal with his unforgiveness and he has to forgive. I believe personally, in my my personal opinion, is that's why he wept. I believe it was a moment of forgiveness. He goes, okay, I'm giving it to the Lord. And watch what he does next in verse 18. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. How do you restore relationships? Here you go. You're going to really love this one. You have to own up to being wrong. Nuh-uh. I'm right all the time. That's what makes me such a great friend. You have to own up to being wrong. You know, oftentimes our attitude in relationships is this. My friends are lucky, lucky, lucky to have me. I mean, look at my shirt. And and we kind of have this superiority complex in our friendships And we just think, yeah, I'm always right. They're always wrong. I never do anything wrong. They do it all the time. And we become a problem. And then um, it becomes uh, an attitude issue in our life. So I just got to fairly warn you for just a second. This one's going to hurt a little bit. Because the biggest issue in your friendships is you. I don't mean that as a smackdown, because here it is. The biggest issue oftentimes in my friendships is me. 
You know why? Because all of us are guilty of, at times in our life, becoming selfish people, aren't we? And in doing so, we become people who don't own up to being wrong when we are wrong. We become too proud to admit that we're wrong. Arrogance has ruined more relationships in this world than you could possibly count. Because you've refused to repent. Say, you know what? What I did was wrong. Some people say, you know, well, what I, done, what, I didn't really do anything wrong. We sweep it on the rug. We say, hey, it's no big deal. The other person's overreacting. And that's not the case. Is it possible that in your relationship, you were wrong? Have you ever stopped to consider that? There's something here that I did that wasn't quite right. I'm not saying that everything the other person did was right, but maybe there's something you did that wasn't right. I, I remember vividly reading an article by a famous preacher one day, um, and he said, always look for the element of truth in your enemy's advice. In other words, when the enemy criticizes you, is there something within there that you need to evaluate and say, well, maybe I need to make a change. Maybe there's something here that I need to listen to and I need to pay attention to. You say, oh, I didn't really do anything wrong. Here's what Jesus said about it, about owning up to being wrong and asking for forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 5, it says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, if you're at church, you're going to worship, you're going to offer your gift, and then remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to them, then come offer your gift. In other words, you know what God really wants in the house of the Lord? Restoration. He wants you to be man enough, woman enough, to walk up in the situation and the circumstances. You know what? Man, I know what I did was wrong, and I know it really hurt you, and I just want you to know that I'm sorry, and I would, I would love for you to forgive me. That takes a very spiritually mature person. Someone who strives to be like the Lord, say, you know what? I want to bring restoration here in the relationship. So here's three great words that you need to remember in your life. I'm so sorry. Can we all say that together right now? I'm so sorry. See that? Some of you, I might have just saved your marriage. Don't let arrogance ruin the relationship by not owning up to when you're wrong. Watch what happens in verse 19. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. How do you restore relationships? You have to look for a godly purpose. You have to look for a godly purpose. Everybody say purpose. Have you ever thought that maybe God is trying to teach you something? Think of Joseph's life for a second. He's a great example. All of the things that happened to him, his brothers hating him, his brothers talking uh, mean to him, his brothers plotting to kill him, his brothers putting him in a pit, his brothers selling him into slavery. He gets wrongfully accused. Every time he turned, it was wrong after wrong after wrong. It was hurt after hurt after hurt. And it became a problem. And then Joseph comes to this great spiritual revelation. You intended it for evil. But God intended it for good, for the saving of many lives. See, if Joseph hadn't gone through all of the trials and the turmoils of his life, he never would have had the capability to deal with the calling God had over his life, to be second in command of all of Egypt. It's not fun to go through those things in life. It's not fun to go through relationship troubles and, and hardships and hurts and pains. Those things are not fun at all. But God uses those things that the enemy intends for wickedness in our life, and He prepares us for the greater calling He has for us down the road. And so in every situation and circumstance in my life, I look for a godly purpose. I say, God, what are you going to teach me here, and how can I use it for your kingdom later? Never overlook the difficult times, because God is using it for something. Look at verse 21. So then, Joseph says, don't, he said, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and he spoke kindly to them. 
How do you restore relationships? I really hope that you write this one down somewhere. Do good to those who harm you and bless them. You know, i got to be honest. I really don't like this one very much. This one is, is not easy at all. See, it's a lot easier to say, I forgive you, and then do nothing. It's a whole other world to do what God's called us to do when we actually do good to them and bless them. That's a whole other level of relationship. In God's kingdom, we act in direct contrast to this kingdom of Satan. Look what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6. He said this, But to you who are listening, are you listening today, church? Okay, because I'm going to read a few verses right now, and I hope you are. To you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Some of you maybe have never read this passage before. Like Jesus said, Jesus said that. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be called children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Need I say more? For some of you, that passage would cause you to have a total drastic life change. The way you do business, the way you respond to your spouse, the way you deal with coworkers, the way you talk to your children, the way you deal with your friends, what you post on social media, that passage right there would totally rock your life. And it should. Because it totally goes against our sinful nature. And you know what the wonderful thing is about this whole message today? Is this is exactly what Jesus did for us. Look at Romans chapter 5. It says this, For if... While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Do you know what the wonderful thing about Jesus is? He gives us an example to follow when it comes to relationships. That while we were still God's enemies, Jesus came down and died for us and paid for our sin that we hadn't even repented of yet and said, I love you so much, I want to make a way for reconciliation so you and I can have an eternal relationship. Come on, somebody. That's good. And through that example, we learn now how to have relationships with other people. That my driving force should be Jesus Christ, my example. And through every relationship of my life, I learn and I strive for reconciliation and peace. Why? So that they too might come closer to Jesus Christ. And that's really the crux of it, isn't it? How do you restore relationships? You first must restore your relationship with God through Jesus. I want to pray for you this morning. God's so faithful to us and He's so good to us that He gives us Joseph as a wonderful example on how to restore relationships. And I hope that you take this with you because you're going to deal with relationships for the rest of your life. But I want to ask you the most important question right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed, just a moment with the Lord. I just want you to think about this. What is your relationship right now with God If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, 
you do not have a relationship with God. And the way to have one is to call upon the Lord Jesus and be saved. Repenting of your sin, owning up to being wrong. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I need your friendship in my life. I need you to be my Lord and my Savior. And if that's you this morning here, you're watching home, at home and online, and you just say, yeah, man, I, I need a relationship with Jesus. You just raise your hand right where you're at and we're going to pray. We're going to believe that God's going to restore relationships in people's lives. And you can just pray something like this. You can just say, dear Jesus, I admit that I'm wrong and I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness and I need your grace. And I ask you to come and forgive me today and be the Lord and the friend of my life. Lord, right now I pray for everyone here listening to this message, Lord, that's right now thinking of that relationship right now that they need to restore, that they need to forgive, that they need to own up to being wrong. Whatever it is in their life, God, you would give them power through the Holy Spirit to do what's right. To be more like you, Jesus, in all of our relationships. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.